Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you as we just come humbly, humbly before you, Lord God, and before your mighty word. Father, I ask that you touch my lips of clay to prophesy to your people, to speak to their hearts, Lord God. Father, to speak to their situations. If it's not in this message, Holy Ghost, put it in my mouth. In Jesus' name, for them we pray. Amen and amen. Well, the Holy Spirit had laid upon my heart a series of the seven churches of Revelation. We're living in the time of Revelation and the coming to pass of many things that are happening in this day and this hour. And the beginning of this book starts with seven churches. And we talked about one last week, and we never finished it, on the church at Ephesus. Now, the book of Revelation is really interesting. It's the only book that promises two things, a blessing to those that read it and those that hear it. And there's another thing it promises. Anyone who takes away from that book, the Bible says their part will be taken away from God. In other words, uh, of, of eternal life. So we don't mess with the book of Revelation at all. Uh, Revelations 1 and 3 says this, Bless, happy to be envied, is the man who reads aloud in the assemblies. Praise God. You know, I'm excited about that because I'm blessed just because I'm reading it. Amen? And the word of this prophecy, and bless, happy to be envied are those who hear it read. That's you. And keep themselves true to the things which are written in it, heeding them and laying them to heart, for the time for them to be fulfilled is near. And it's getting nearer and nearer. Now, last week I mentioned this, and I'll mention it to you again just to remind you that these seven churches that the Lord picked were prophetic. I mean, why not the church of Jerusalem? Why not other churches? He picked seven specific churches. And that some of these churches thought they were doing great. Some thought they were doing bad. And the ones that they thought were doing bad were actually doing well. God doesn't judge by numbers or our pocketbook. God judges by the heart. God judges by the heart. He looks upon the heart of man. Amen? And we're going to see that as we study through these churches. Now, there's four things that these churches spoke about. There was a literal church of that day. They were all excavated, which, by the way, only one church remains out of these seven churches, which was Smyrna. That's the only one that remains. That's the second one we'll talk about later. Uh, elements of these churches exist in churches today. And here's the third thing. It's a personal application to your life. As we look at these churches, how does it apply to your life personally? See, we take the Word of God and apply it to our own heart. We look in the mirror of his word. And here's the fourth thing. It's a history prophetically of the church. And we're going to see that. And I'll show you this on this next slide. Each church seems to have a symbolism of the, the church age. All the way up to the last church was Laodicea, which we'll talk about it when we get to it. The first church is Ephesus, which speaks of the apostolic age. An age when they were reaching out and preaching the gospel. Seemed like they were doing everything right. But the Lord had some things he had to say to this church. And we're going to pick back up where I left off last week, in the church of Ephesus. Now, Scripture tells us in Revelations 2 and 1, to the angel, the messenger of the assemblies, the church in Ephesus, now speaking of the pastor, these are the words of him who holds the seven stars, which are the messengers of the seven churches, in his right hand. Now, remember this, the right hand always speaks of the favor of God. And we're at the right hand of God. In Christ, you are favored. In Christ Jesus, you are highly favored. I don't know if anybody told you, but only prophets, priests, and kings, and judges got the Holy Ghost. And you've got the Holy Ghost in you. You've been honored far more than any worldly honor this world could ever give you. Listen, you, you've been so honored by God to have the Holy Spirit living in you. What an honor to have His Spirit dwelling in us. Thank you, Lord. So it says here, the seven churches in His right hand, which goes up about among the seven golden lampstands, which are on the seven churches. So He said the Lord is in the midst of the seven churches. Now, Revelations 2 and 2. He said, I know your industry and activities, laborious toil and trouble, and your patient endurance and how you cannot tolerate wicked men and have tested and critically appraised those who call themselves apostles. You know, I said this before, the foolish trust, the wise test. You have to test things and test people. God tests people. Before I ever became a pastor, a friend of mine looked at me after 20 years. We had been together. He had never told this to me before. He said to me, God wants me to tell you, you passed the test. You passed the test. And that's right before I became a pastor. God will put you through a series of things in your life. Amen. I, I call them tests. Amen. And he already knows what we'll do, but he wants you to see you so that we can change and grow in him. But I never forget that when he told me I passed the test. But, but we need to test people, if you will. And if you look at Joseph in the Old Testament, when God had showed him that he would be a ruler in Egypt, and his brothers came and bowed down for him, at that day, he didn't, just, he didn't just say, okay, guys, look, my dreams came to pass. He tested his brother, and before, he trusted him. Very, very important. 
So it says, tested and critically appraised those who call themselves apostles, special messengers of Christ, and yet are not, and have found them to be imposters and liars. Listen, if you really have to worry about a title, we're called to be servants of the Most High God. You're not getting any higher than a servant. We're called to be servants. Jesus showed us the example of servanthood when he, he washed the disciples' feet, and we're all called to be servants in the kingdom. Amen? That excites me. Glory to God. You know you got the Holy Ghost when you love serving people. Amen? Now, this is the epistle of John because he tested, the Bible says the, the Ephesians tested those that said they were apostles and not. Now, 1 John 4, 1 says this, Beloved, and you are beloved of God, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Let me tell you a revelation here. We're not led by the prophets. In other words, you seek God and you get something in your spirit, and prophecy should confirm that. In other words, if somebody comes to you and says, uh, you know, sister, brother, you need to go to Afghanistan. If God hadn't put that in your heart, man, you need to say, look, that's not in my heart, man. When God puts something in your heart, a prophet will confirm it usually. Oh, yeah. I remember there was a man prophesying, and he was calling people out, and calling this one out, and calling that one out. And I had something in my heart, and I said, God, if this is in my heart, I, and this is from you, I ask you to have that man call me out. And he said, he, he had that British accent. That's so cool when he has a British accent. Sir, you, right there. Yeah, yeah, you. And I was like, me? And he called me out and literally read my mail. What I had in my heart was totally of God, and sure enough, it came to pass. One of the things that I was praying about was prison. I had a prison ministry, and God brought revival to the prison ministry. We were there about a week after this, a Sunday, and I began ministering, and what happened was uh, another brother was actually supposed to minister. I said, hold on one second. And as I began to minister, the Holy Ghost fell, and there were orange uniforms all over the floor. I mean, all over the floor. They were wiped out in the jailhouse. They had a guy in the front row, and I remember my associate pastor Hall was there, and we said, devil, come out. And the guy went, Wah! and he bent all the way back, and he was holding his orange uniform. I mean, the guy was just wiped out. They were just, just hitting the ground everywhere. They had one in the back pew standing there like this. I couldn't reach him. I said, Holy Ghost, touch him, and the power of God hit him. And what was the deputy doing? He was like this. That's exactly what he was doing. And I told the deputy, I said, sir, we can't do this. This is the Holy Ghost doing this. We can't do this. This is God doing this in this place. And it was so amazing because when the time came to take him out, and, and they said, okay, it's time to go. He said, give him five more minutes. Give him five more minutes. My God, that man had some sense. Give him more time with God. Now, if an unsaved deputy knows that these men need more time with God, how much more do we need time with God? Amen? Give him more time. Give him more time. We need to, amen, marinate in the presence of God. Oh, my goodness. Sometimes we just rush out of the presence of God. We need to marinate in his presence. He said, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Hereby we know the spirit of Christ. Look at this. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God, and every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, where have you heard that it should come, and even now is already in the world. Real simple. Real simple to find out if something's of God or not. Now, Revelations 2 and 3, this is what he said to this church. And this is all good stuff, by the way. He said, I know you are enduring patiently and are bearing up for my name's sake. And you have not fainted or become exhausted or grown weary. So this is a church. It's pretty amazing. They were coming to church. They're serving God. They're not weary. They're not, they're not uh, if you will, by all external means doing bad. And he commends them for that. He says, look, you, you run in the race. You're doing well. I'm really, you know, commend you for that. But look what he says. But this one charge I have against you, that you've abandoned the love that you had at first. You deserted me, your first love. Now, I reminded you of this last week, and I'm going to remind you again. When Jesus corrects somebody, he told them all the good things they were doing, and then he brought up the thing that they needed to do, the thing that they had wrong. Many times, parents, as we correct our kids, tell them all the good things that they're doing. Don't just beat them down and say, you're doing this wrong, you're doing that wrong, you're doing this wrong, because sometimes we do that, and all we do is destroy a relationship. We need to encourage people first and say, you're doing all these things good, but this is the area you need to work on. And then at the end of this epistle you're going to see at the end of this church you're going to see he said if you change this is what I'll do he gives them hope in that correction amen he says if you change this is the blessings coming to you 
But he said, I have this one charge against you, that you have left, abandoned the love that you had at first. So in other words, they were doing all these things out of duty. Let me tell you, we get to serve God. I love serving God. Do you rise up and, and it's time to come to church and say, well, I got my duty to fulfill? Or do you come to church saying, I'm going to worship God. I'm going to praise God. I'm going to read the word of God. You know, I, I've done these Bible reading programs where you read so much a day. And I would find the Holy Spirit tugging on my heart, saying, you know, read over here. Read over here. See, he's a God of relationship and intimacy. I used to uh, try to pray an hour. I thought it was so long, a long time ago. And I even put a time clock, you know, tick, 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 and it go, ding, hours up. And I would try to pray, and it seems so formal. It seems so difficult even to pray an hour. But you see, when I start letting the Spirit of God lead me, I would come into His presence, and time would just go away. And I was just worshiping Him. I was just enamored with the King. And, and it, hours would go by. Hours would go by, and it seemed but a moment in His presence. And it's so wonderful when you pray that way with God, just in love with the King. Amen? Now, the Bible says in the last days many's hearts will be cold because iniquity shall abound listen there's iniquity every which way you turn sin will throw a big wet bl uh, blanket over your love relationship with Christ man you got to avoid it like the plague walk with God talk with God and spend time with him he says here uh, uh, because iniquity shall abound the love of many shall wax cold the word love there is agape it means the love of God it's not just you know love as we think it's the love of God the agape of God the love that's in your heart growing cold we don't want to let our love grow cold. And that word also means chilling, so we don't want to chill. Amen? We don't want to chill. Now, I want to show you this. Our first love is a love of espousal. Love of espousal. Passionate zeal that's motivated by a love for our Savior who laid down his life for us. Jeremiah 2.2 2 says this. Go and cry. He told Jeremiah to do this. Go and cry in the ears of Jerusalem, saying, Thus says the Lord, I earnestly remember the kindness and devotion of your youth. Now, this is amazing. This church had great doctrine but bad devotion. Just pure devotion towards God. A zeal towards God. They had lost that. You know, there's an old song. You lost that love and feeling, right? But love's not a feeling. Love's a commitment. Love's a commitment. Sometimes we think we've fallen out of love because we don't have a feeling anymore. You look at your husband and you look at your wife, well, I just don't love him anymore. Love, and the next day you turn around and say you do. That's a feeling. Love is a commitment. You say, baby, I'm going to love you through thick and thin. I'm going to love you in good times and bad. It's a commitment. Feelings follow commitment. When you just stick in that commitment, the feelings will come, feelings will go, but we don't follow feelings. Do you wake up every morning when it's Monday morning, you had a hard weekend and say, I just love my wife. I just love my husband. You're just full of feelings. Sometimes I need a resurrection to get out of bed, you know. Oh, oh. Gee, what, I forget what day it is sometimes. My God. But love is a commitment. So I'm going to be with you to the end of time. Amen? Not based on anything else. It's not based on, listen, we grow old, we get heavy, you know, we get love handles. As they say, things happen, right? Love is a commitment. It's not based on Hollywood looks. Amen? It's a commitment saying, I'm going to love you for who you are. So he says, go and cry in the ears of Jerusalem, saying, thus says the Lord, I earnestly remember the kindness and devotion of your youth, your love after your betrothal in Egypt and marriage at Sinai. When you followed me in the wilderness in a land not sown. So they were a people committed to God. It says, now actually we know they sinned and a lot of things happened, but I won't go into that now. It says, Israel was holiness, something set apart from the ordinary purposes, dedicated to the Lord, the first fruits of his harvest. Now, I want to ask ladies in here, how would you feel if, if your husband or your, your boyfriend, he, who's saying, hey, I want you to potentially be my wife, say, listen, I'm going to give you my heart one day a week, but the other seven days, I'm, you know, I'm going to have some other girlfriends. How would you feel about that? How would you feel about your wife said, you know, you know what, I'm going to be committed to you, you know, five days a week, but two days is open season. I'm free. You got me for five days. You wouldn't like that, but we do that to God sometimes. I'll commit my heart to you on Sunday, but the rest of the week, you know, I'm just going to do what I want. My heart's going to go here. My heart's going to go there after so many other things but you, God. Listen, God is a jealous God, and he deserves first place in our life. He deserves our commitment. He deserves our devotion. He is so, so good. Man, he's better than we know, and he gets better and better, sweeter and sweeter. I've been saved 29 years, and I love him more than I did when I first met him because he's a good God. I've seen him heal my body. I've seen him deliver me financially. I've seen him open miraculous doors for me, but I love him for who he is because his heart is always good. The devil will lie on your ears and say many things about God. He will slander God to you and say, God doesn't love you. You're going through this because of this, that, and the other thing. Listen, God loves you no matter what. The sun is still shining even though there's clouds over, over above 
And though you can't see the sun, you know it's still shining. God still loves you at your very worst. He doesn't change. His love is constant. He's for you. And if he's for you, who can be against you? Amen? Been through a lot of things, but I've been through a lot of things with God. Amen? And I've come out on the other side better with him, and so will you. You know, there's a, something in the scripture that says it came to pass. It came, so things come. Difficulties happen. Problems happen. Many things happen in life, but it came to pass. With God, you're going to come out better on the other side because he's such a good God. I'm prophesying to somebody today about your situation. You're going to come out better than you've ever been because of God in your life, because of him. I don't care how many people rise up against you. I don't care how many enemies you face. You and God are a majority, and you're going to shine for Jesus Christ. No one can take you out. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He's got the last word in your life. No sickness, no disease. Nobody can take you out. God's got the last word. That excites me. You know, I can't tell you, you know, what my future holds. I, I don't know, but I know who holds my future, so I'm going to be all right. I'm going to be all right, amen? Glory to God. Now, the Song of Solomon is a beautiful picture of the bride of Christ in love with the king. Now, when I first read this book, I read some of the imagery there, and I tried it with my wife, and it didn't work very well. When I said, baby, your teeth is like a flock of goats. Your neck is like the Tower of Lebanon. I mean, it just wasn't happening, you know what I'm saying? Just, I guess it was a different era. It didn't work, you know. I tried that. <laughs> Song of Solomon 2, 8 and through 15. He said, the voice of my beloved, my God. You want to get on fire for God? Hear his voice. I remember the first time I heard God's voice. Now this is, you got to realize my perspective here. Big sinner, doing all kind of junk in my life. God's talking to me. I was raised in a religious denomination, so I always saw priests and other people like, I wish I could talk to God like that person, thinking that that person was closer to God because they were in a ministry, which is totally untrue. But when I heard God's voice for the first time, there was a fire burning in my heart. God is talking to me. It just kind of makes you stick your chest up. God's talking to me. He's speaking to me. Wow. That just so impressed me that God would talk to me. When I heard his voice, just a fire burned within me. Which some of you, I've said it before, and I'll tell you the very first thing he said to me, and i never forget it. I was kneeling by my bed, and it was late one night. And I said, God, I love you. God, I worship you. I thank you, Father. You're such a good God. I said, when I get to heaven, do I have to wait in line to talk to you? That was my question. He said, are you waiting in line now? I said, no, I'm not waiting in line. He said, you won't be waiting in line then either. I said, I don't understand that, but it's okay. Glory to God. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. That was my first conversation with God. Yeah. Okay, let me see here. It says, the voice of my beloved, behold, he cometh leaping upon the mountains, skipping upon the hills. My beloved is like a roe or a young heart. Behold, he standeth behind our wall. Look at this. He looketh forth at the windows, showing himself through the lattice. This is really interesting because the Bible says we see through a glass darkly. In other words, we're seeing Christ through the word of God. You may not get the full image of him in his full glory, but we see him by the spirit. And the spirit of God takes us from glory to glory, if you will. So we're seeing Christ and we love him by faith. You see, your, your, your strong faith sees Christ high and lifted up. And here she says, I see him through the lattice. So my beloved spake and said to me, rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. This excites me. God has called you away to be with him. He's called you to intimacy with him. Intimacy with the king is what God has called us all to. He said, for lo, the winter is past. The rain is over and gone. Now, this is amazing. The winter is past. In other words, the barren times of life are past. God is calling you up into intimacy with him. One of the most amazing scriptures I find in the Bible is David had a wife named Michael. And the Bible says that David danced before the Lord. Now, if you really read it literally, he stripped down basically to his underwear and he's dancing before the Lord, before the whole nation. And his wife, Michael, looked out of the window and said, oh, how glorious was the king today. She despised him in her heart because he worshiped God. And the Bible says she was barren from that day forward. So what does that tell us? She was married to the king, but she was barren because she had no intimacy. And if you don't have intimacy with God, you can come to church, you can serve God and say, I'm a Christian, I'm married to the king, but you've got no intimacy, so you're not birthing anything in the kingdom. No production, if you will, in the kingdom. You've got to have intimacy with the king. And that's what happened. Relationship and no intimacy, God wants intimacy. So here he says, the winter is past, the rain is over and gone, the flowers appear in the earth, and the time of singing of birds has come, and the voice of the turtle dove is heard in the land. It speaks of spring, speaks of a first love. It goes on to say, the fig tree putteth forth her green figs, and the vines with the tender grapes give a good 
smell. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. Oh, my dove. I should have read that to my wife. That might have worked a little better than a flock of goats, huh? Oh, my dove, thou art in the clefts of the rocks. Now, I love this because Moses, when he was up on the mountain, he was hidden in the cleft of a rock, and the glory of the Lord went by. And here it says, in the secret places of the stairs, let me see thy countenance. I don't know if you really get grasped this, but there's a secret place that God has for each and every one of us that you can go away with God. You can come away into the presence of the Lord and you'll see him as you never saw him. He'll reveal himself to you as he's never revealed himself to you in the secret place. I call it the hiding place. When you get alone with God in that place with God, man, I'm going to tell you what, that's where I want to be. That's where I want to live in the presence of God. The Lord wants me to tell you this. Uh, we had before I was pastor and we would stop at the church every morning and pray that I was attending and this one morning the glory of God came down I mean it was just me and God nobody else was in the church God's glory came down and at the time I was struggling with something in my heart dealing with something and I, I can't explain it to you but whatever I was dealing with was gone completely gone and I'll never forget this the glory was so strong on me as I got in the car I began to drive like any other day to work and when I got to the city of New Orleans I remember seeing old houses with peeling paint and boards falling off I mean something you'd say take a bulldozer to it and all I was saying was look how beautiful look how beautiful Oh, it's, everything was so beautiful his glory I was seeing things from the perspective of God and everything was so so beautiful I wasn't seeing a negativity I wasn't seeing all the, the decay and rot I was seeing the glory of God in everything it makes no sense in the natural but his glory came upon me and when the glory comes upon you will start seeing things in a whole new light the person you thought you can't love you're gonna love them because you'll start seeing God in that person if you're only seeing negative things and you say you have a gift of discernment that's not discernment that's a critical mind sometimes we have nothing but a critical mind and we call it discernment and you push people away but when you see people in the light of God's love and mercy you'll start loving that person love is not blind love sees and still loves says I see you're a mess I see what you do but you know what I love you and I'm gonna keep loving you because I see you as God sees you amen you see with the eyes of Christ not with the eyes of the flesh you can find a fault you don't have to look too long it, it's really easy to do but with Christ and his love you'll see the best in other people you know and that's what God wants us to do to see the best do you believe the best about other people or the worst I remember working at a job and somebody had stole a printer and, and this one said I think this one did it I think that one did it. I think this one did it and I remember saying I don't believe they did it I don't believe they did it at all I know them. I don't believe they did that I was believing the best about them and as it turned out none of them did steal it but when something happens do you believe the worst about people yeah I knew Pastor Joe he had shifty eyes man I knew it I knew it I knew it do you believe that or do you believe the best when you hear something negative about somebody so often we're just so trained to believe the negative we've been let down sometimes when our heroes or, or people we look up to and whether in ministry or in, in, in life have fallen listen we have to look up to Jesus he's our example in everything we do amen but but we don't need to be critical look for the very best in people I try to believe the best about everybody now here he says arise my love my fair one and come away oh my dove thou art in the clefts of the rock in the secret places of the stairs let me see thy countenance let me hear thy voice oh my god that's what I pray for each and every one of you that you hear his voice I'll tell you my heart's desire for you as a pastor that you have a passionate love for Jesus Christ that you are a person after God's own heart that your heart burns with a passion for him every day that is my desire amen for you to hear his voice and love the Lord with everything that you are he said for sweet is thy voice and oh it is so sweet and thy countenance is comely and he says uh, something interesting here take us the foxes the little foxes that spoil the vines for our vines have tender grapes now often it's the little things that mess us up the little distractions of life that mess us up in our relationships and our relationship with God and here scripture says in Jeremiah 6 and 16 Jeremiah prophesied and he said thus says the Lord stand ye in the ways and see and ask for the old paths where is the good way and walk therein and ye shall find rest for your souls but they said we will not walk therein so it's the little things in life what's the old ways seeking God's face studying his word spending time with him now think of this for a second how would it work in the natural if you have a wife or a husband and you spend no time together you're still married but there's no time there's no no you don't know each other I don't know you anymore some people say well you spent no time with them so what do you have to do to know them spend time with them rekindle that love relationship again spend a lot of time together 
especially couples raising kids in a natural, what happens is you get so busy about the kids, you have no time for your spouse. I got news for you. The day is coming when those little blessings are going to move out and say, see ya, wouldn't want to be ya. Got some money for me? Oh, yeah. My wife was skating at a skating rink, and she fell and broke her wrist. And she gets up many years ago, broke her wrist. Oh, my wrist hurts. And my son says, can I have a dollar? <laughs> broken wrist, can I have a dollar? <laughs> They're just so focused on themselves and what they're doing. But they're going to move out, and all you've got is that spouse. That's the one that you're going to spend time with. And sometimes people, when their kids move out, they look at each other and like, who is this person? Because you revolved everything around the kids. Remember this. Intim ministry is a child of intimacy, right? You got married because you love each other, and they're, they're, if you will, a product of that love relationship. So don't neglect the love relationship. That's like loving the ministry and not loving God. And everything revolves around the kids. Everything revolves around ministry. You seek God, you'll have ministry. You, you love, that, love that spouse and, and make them first place in your life. The kids are going to grow up, move out. It's going to happen. Going to happen. And they'll bring, amen, they'll bring back grandkids to each other, house and home. So glory to God. I know my dad used to say, honey, hide the food. The locusts are coming. The locusts are coming. And we were locusts, man. We came over and <laughs> descended on the house. <laughs> Cleaned him out. <laughs> Song of Solomon 5.1 is, is a beautiful picture that of, of, actually it's a picture of love that begins to grow cold from his Shunammite bride. So I want to show you this. He said, I've come into my garden, my sister, my spouse. Now if you will, we're the garden of the Lord. We're the garden of the Lord. I can show you he's a gardener because Mary, when she went to the tomb, she thought he was the gardener in the garden. We're the garden of the Lord. And he said this, my sister, my promised bride, I have gathered my myrrh with, with my uh, psalm and spice from your sweet words, I have garnered the richest perfumes and spices. I have eaten my honeycomb with my honey. I have drunk my wine with my milk. Eat, O oh friends, feast on, O oh revelers of the palace. You can never make my lover disloyal to me. Drink, yes, drink abundantly of love, O oh precious one. For now I know you are mine, irrevocably mine. I like that. Oh, glory. Irrevocably his. With his confident words still thrilling her heart. Through the lattice, she saw her shepherd turn away and disappear into the night. I went to sleep, but my heart stayed awake. I dreamed that I heard the voice of my beloved as he knocked at the door of my mother's cottage. Open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my spotless one. Remember, he's coming back for a church without spot or wrinkle. He said, for I am wet with the heavy night dew, which speaks of the anointing. How many know when you spend time with God, what's on him gets on you? You want the anointing? You want, you, want, you want the power of God in your life? Spend time with him. What's on him gets on you. You become like who you hang with. I can prove it to you. What's on them gets on you. Hang around somebody who smokes. <sighs> you're going to come over. You're going to stink of smoke. Yeah. Will smoking send you to hell? No, it won't. But it'll make you smell like you've been there and get you to eternity a little bit quicker. Oh, yeah. I don't know why I'm picking on that, but like one person said, I feel sorry for the cigarette. So why is that? It's got a fire on one end and a fool on the other, but I won't go there. <laughs> oh, boy. Open to me, my sister, my love, my dove. My spotless one, he said, for I am wet with the heavy night dew. My hair is covered with it. But weary from the day at the vineyards, I had already sought my rest. I put off my garment. How can I put it on again? I wash my feet. And how could I again soil them? In other words, you know, he's coming to spend time in fellowship with his bride, and she's like, nah, you know. I don't know how I can do that. He says, my beloved put his hand at the hole of the door, and my heart was moved for him. So she's basically saying, nah, I don't have time right now. How many times God comes to our hearts, spend time with him, and we push him off? Maybe some, he wakes up in the middle of the night to spend time with him. I've had God wake me up in the middle of the night, and sometimes I fell back asleep again. And I've had, him, I've had God wake me up, so just to go spend time with him, to be alone with him. So my beloved put his hand at the hole of the door and my heart was moved for him. I rose up to open him, my beloved, with my hands dripped with myrrh. Now, myrrh speaks of something that you give somebody who's about to die. How many know you have to die to yourself in a relationship with God? You got to die to your flesh. You got to die to self in serving God. Somebody calls you and it's 8 o'clock at night, the game's on, and they say, hey, listen, I need you to go pray for somebody at the hospital. And you go, I can't hear you too good. Something's wrong with the phone. You got to die to self to serve God. Or God comes to you and says, I want you to pray right now. You know his voice. He says, pray now. I heard a story of a man. He, he was a Dallas 
Cowboys football game. And they were about to kick a field goal. The end of the game, it was going to be the winning field goal. And the Spirit of the Lord spoke to him and said, I need to talk to you right now. I need you to pray right now. And he said, oh, one second, God, one second. Just, I'll, I'll pray in five minutes. I'll pray for an hour if you like in five minutes. So he waited. And you know what happened? He kicked the field goal. They won the game. But he lost out because the Spirit of the Lord, the anointing just moved. And he said, okay, God, I'll pray an hour. And God said, I didn't want you to pray an hour. I wanted you to pray right then. It's obedience that he wants. That really literally happened. And this minister learned a lesson. When God speaks and calls me, just put everything else aside. Because that game's not going to matter in eternity. That game won't matter. We caught a bunch of fish going fishing. Those fish, some of them have already been eaten and being digested. It doesn't matter how many fish we caught, but it matters that we caught a captain. Amen? That's the eternal fish. Glory to God. Doing what God says it was really matters. She said, I rose up to open for my beloved, and my hands dripped with myrrh, and my fingers with with liquid sweet-scented myrrh, which had uh, been left upon the handles of the bolt. And I opened for my beloved, but my beloved had turned away and withdrawn himself. My God. Oh, my God. He had withdrawn. Man, thank God for the presence of the Lord. You know, the Bible says about the Spirit of the Lord, he said, I will withdraw myself to my place till they acknowledge their offense. If you're walking around in bitterness and anger and all kind of stuff, listen, you got to let those things go because we want to walk in God's presence. We want to walk in God's anointing. Amen. Nothing is worth it losing that I opened for my beloved my beloved had turned away and withdrawn himself and was gone my soul went forth to him when he spoke but it failed me and now he was gone I sought him but I could not find him I called him but he gave me no answer wow she's calling for him but getting no answer I remember years ago I was at church praying and God was trying to get through to me some of you heard me say this before but I'll never forget it I was kneeling down and I was praying and I was seeking God and all of a sudden call it a dream call it a trance because I was I don't think I was sleeping but it seemed like somebody was knocking on the doors of the church and it seemed like this and all of a sudden it was like boom 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 I physically got up and I was seeing the doors. I'm walking now. I'm not sleeping. I'm walking, looking at the doors. And the doors are going like this. Boom. 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 They look like they're bending in about to break. And I'm walking to go open the doors thinking, what is behind that door? And all of a sudden, it was normal like it is now. And, and I, God was trying to get through to me at that time in my life. And I didn't, I didn't understand. I'm like, what was, what was that? What's going on? You know, he says he knocks at the door of our heart to get through to us. So we open up to him. We've got to open up our hearts to God. And God was trying to get through to me at that time. Many times he comes to us so we don't make some bad choices and do some wrong things. And many times we push him away. God's trying to deal with our hearts so we don't get into some situations that he doesn't want us to be in. But we push him away. My, my way is better. And then we go our way and we get into a lot of trouble. Listen, God loves us and he comes to us so we don't make some of those major mistakes. But he did get through to me. Glory to God. Amen. Now look at this. It says, the watchmen who go about the city found me. They struck me. They wounded me. The keepers of the walls took my veil and my mantle from me. I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, if you find my beloved, that you tell him that I am sick with love, simply sick to be with him. Man, are you desiring God that much that you got to be with him? Or you worry about everybody else? Let me tell you. I've seen some people that were hooked on drugs, and they didn't care. You had to get out of their way. They were going to get what they are going to get. You understand? And if they got to run over you to get it. They were so, so, if you will, addicted to that thing. Let me tell you, are you addicted to his love? That I'm going to get to the altar. I'm going to get to church. I'm going to press in and go after him with all my heart. I've just got to be with him. Man, you got to have a desire for him. I'm addicted to his love and his presence. Well, you just got to be with him. Man, you, th here's this lady saying she's sick with love. You know heaven's a glorious place streets of gold jewels and and many many mighty things but if God's not there I don't want to be there I want to be wherever he's at now we know he's there glory to God but where he's at is heaven to me he makes it heaven to me now here's another scripture I have people that tell me that God doesn't speak to them I never heard God's voice let me tell you I ask him this all the time do you seek God with all your heart because if you do you're going to find him if you do you're going to hear his voice I feel led to tell you this again and I've, I've said this a few times but for the benefit of those who haven't heard me say this God wants me to say it as I was teaching Sunday school one time I just never ever forget this I was praying for the kids and I was laying hands on each child and prophesying I went to the first child and I said the Lord thy God would say unto you and the spirit of the Lord just moved powerfully went to the second child and I went I got nothing nothing I mean just nothing okay I'll come back 
went to the next child and the Lord thy God was saying to you and the Lord thy God was saying to you and I'm just prophesying over each child and the Lord thy God and his spirit was just coming so easy the spirit of the Lord is just speaking and I'm laying hands on the next child and I'm laying hands on the next child and I'm just going down the line there's about 13 kids in Sunday school class and uh, some of you might have even been there I don't know a couple of you might have been there that day but there was one young girl that didn't get a word from the Lord got nothing from God and as I turned around she had her hands stretched to the heavens tears were rolling down this child's face I mean just just rolling down her face her hands are stretched out to God she was just oh please 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 speak to me please please and I'm thinking to myself my God what's going on here you know I I didn't know what was going on and and as soon as I touched this child the Lord said said this I passed you up on purpose yeah so he said I passed you up on purpose and then then what the Lord said is, if you want to hear from me, this is how you got to seek me all the days of your life. With all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength. You want to hear from me? This is how you got to do it. I was in Sunday school class that day learning something. You want to hear from God? How bad do you want to hear from God? Are you just a casual Christian? I'll just come to church and be casual. Are you have fervent love towards God? I want to get close to him. I want to know his heartbeat like John the apostle who put his ear to Jesus' chest. You know, the, the greatest revelations ever given about the end times was Daniel and John. And the Bible says they were greatly beloved men. They were men who had the heartbeat of God. They were men who had intimacy with the king. And he revealed all that to them. Ministry has nothing to do with intimacy. There is nothing that can stop you from being close to the king if you want to be close to God. You can get as close to him as you want. Where did I get that from? God. God. Yeah. Many years ago, I asked him, God, put me in the ministry. And he said, you don't want to be in the ministry. I said, I don't. He said, no, what you really want is to be close to me. I said, yeah, I want to be close to you. So seeking God and being close to him became first in my life. And guess what happens? Ministry is a child of intimacy. Ministry happens when you get close to the king. So you'll seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. That means all that you are, go after God. You'll find him. Now, we always make time for what's important to us. Here's a picture of two guys. says, I should have went to church, but I, I, I missed kickoff. Next guy. He says, me too. My wife just left me. I lost my job, and I need prayer, but he's watching the game. <laughs> Priorities. Putting God first. Putting first things first in your life. So if you don't have time to pray, read scriptures. You're busier than God ever intended you to be. Make time for what's important to you. Make time for the King of kings and the Lord of glory. And those who are married, make time for that spouse. Go on dates. We still date. We still go on dates. Friday night was always family night for us. I'll tell, tell you something funny. They had a guy come by my house one time. He started the ministry. He said, I got to tell you something, Pastor Joe. I got a word from God for you. I got to tell you something. I said, it, it has to be tonight? He says, yeah. Now, Friday night was family night, right? So he comes by my house. And man, he's got to give me this word. He sits down. He says, you need to spend more time with your family. This is family night. You just interrupted family night to tell me what I'm doing. <laughs> I appreciate that. Listen, I was already doing that. You need to spend time with your family, yes, but time with that spouse. Amen. Go on dates together. Man, if you feel your love growing cold, buy her some flowers. Glory to God. Take her out. You know, don't, don't pull off the ones off of somebody's grave and say, here what I got. Here, I got this for you, baby. I, you know. <laughs> Let me tell you what wives don't like, guys. They don't like this. Most wives don't like last minute thoughtless gifts. My wife does it. If, if it's birthday, anniversary, Christmas, and I get it five minutes before we're supposed to go out, mm-mm. Mm -mm. no thought put into that thing and gets me in trouble so I gotta, I've got to get her something and put time in that relationship amen because that's not going to really bless her if I don't do that I got to tell you this because Christmas is coming I told you about Christmas last time I'll tell you one Christmas we didn't have much money and my wife said listen money's really tight this year don't buy me anything for Christmas I said, really? She said, no, baby. Let's just get the kids something. And I thought that was so spiritual and selfless, but I believed that lie from hell. I mean, I had that hook, line, and sinker. <sighs> oh, yeah. Christmas morning came. Kids got all their gifts. We're so excited. And my wife brought out, I got you something. And you ever see those films when you see somebody's face, it's like, whoosh, 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 whoosh. That's what it was like. Oh, no. I remember telling her, you said, you know, we weren't getting anything for each other. You, you said that. She's like, that's ah, okay. <laughs> oh, God. Felt like a total dog, man. We go to church, and that morning, it was Christmas Day, and it happened to be a Sunday, and we go to church. And you just see ladies, you know, look at my husband, got me. It's a big diamond ring. To my wife, you know. And I just was like, get over here. Boom. 
I want to almost scream, fire, fire, empty the building. Oh, my God. Everywhere she went, you know, somebody was showing them what they got. And they say, what did Joey get you for Christmas? Nothing. <gasps> <gasps> oh, I never heard the end of it. Ever since then, I don't believe what she says when she says that junk, man. Don't believe that. <laughs> oh, yeah. The other big lie was this one. i never forget this year. I don't know why I'm telling you. It's about relationship. If you knew me, you would know what I want. You would know what I want. I'm thinking, oh, my God. <laughs> what do I get? So what did I do? I called my daughter. What does she want? <laughs> what does she want? Tell me now. She didn't know. So what did I did? I learned something. It's called the shotgun effect. I just start buying all kind of stuff, man. You know, I got some things wrong, but I got some right. It's just a doormat, really? A doormat? I'm trying, baby. I'm trying. <laughs> oh, boy. I've learned a lot, guys. I've learned a lot. Yeah, don't believe those lies. Luke 10, 38. Now, look at this. He says, this is, the Ephesians were so busy about the king's business, they had no time for the king. You ever see somebody in a deathbed say this? I've never seen this yet. I wish I'd have went to work more. I wish I'd have made more money. I wish I would have been more, more of, you know, in, risen higher in, in, in this world and, and, uh, and had a higher position. They don't say that. They say, man, I wish I would have spent more time with my kids, with my wife. Wish I would have loved my wife more. Wish I would have served God more. Wish I would have done more for the kingdom. Amen. And spent more time doing what God wanted me to do. Now, here's a picture you can get so busy about the king's business and so busy about business, you have no time for the king and no time for the people that God put under your roof. Like one person said, I want to win the whole world. I said, what about the people under your roof? What about the people under your roof? I can love people as long as they don't live with me, they say, right? Love is not blind. It sees and still loves. Can you love the ones under your own roof? Now, it came to pass as they went that he entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. Now, this is the Mary, many believe is Mary Magdalene, that washed his feet with her tears, okay? But Martha was encumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou now care that my sister had left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she come and help me. In other words, she's sitting there at your feet. I'm serving. I'm pouring the drinks. I'm, I'm cleaning up. I'm doing everything. And here she is sitting at your feet. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha. Now when God says something in his word twice, he's trying to get your attention. Moses, Moses. Simon, Simon. Martha, Martha. When he says it twice... He's getting your attention. You say, listen up. Thou art careful or worried and troubled about many things, but look at this. But one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. It's really interesting that Martha means that becomes bitter, and Mary's name means rebellion. Here's a picture. Sometimes people can become bitter because you're so busy serving and spending no time with the king. Why aren't they doing this? Why aren't they doing this? Getting bitter in service for the king. It happens. You know, children's ministry, well, they didn't show up. They didn't do this. Getting bitter over the things of ministry. No, we're not, we're not to do that. Mary's name means rebellion. And this is, this is an amazing thing. She was sitting at the feet of the king. It's often those who rebelled the most and were in sin the most that loved the most because they were forgiven the most. Yeah, don't ever forget where you came from. Don't ever forget where God brought you from. Remember all the great forgiveness he's done for you and, and, and all the mercy he's shown you. And you're going to stay in love with the king. You've forgiven much, you're going to love much. I often say, in my family, I was the black sheep, the chief of sinners, and God saved me. I love him so much because he washed away my sins and he cleansed me with his precious blood and filled me with his spirit. Oh, my goodness, I love him for what he's done for me. So this is an amazing thing. One thing. Mary had, and she found it. The one thing, one thing that's very important to God. The rich young ruler learned about one thing that he lacked. And this is where I want to go with this with the church of Ephesus. Remember, they had one thing that they were missing, but it was a major one thing. So the certain ruler asked him, saying, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why callest thou me good? None is good save one, that is God. Thou knowest the commandments. Don't commit adultery. Don't kill. Don't steal. Don't bear false witness. Honor thy father and mother. So he he, he, you know, he knew the commandments. And this is what he said. All these things have I kept from my youth up. But when Jesus heard these things, he said unto him, Yet thou lackest one thing. One thing. What's this most important thing? Sell all that thou hast and distribute unto the poor. And thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And come and follow me. And when he heard this, he was very sorrowful, for he was very rich. 
See, he loved something more than God. He loved money, maybe his position, but it's all gone. He couldn't take it with him. The one thing he needed was the true devotion to God, a heart after God, a love after God. Remember this, what you're willing to walk away from determines what God can bring to you. Some of us, you could be in a relationship with someone, you think that guy is so precious or that girl is so precious. Listen, if you're willing to walk away from it, determines what God can bring to you. If it's taking you out of Christ, you put Christ first. Seek first the kingdom. If that's of God, it'll be added to you. If it's not, it won't. It's that simple. Put God first and everything that belongs to God will come to you. It'll come to you. It's so simple. But, but she said, he said, no, no, put the kingdom first. Put the house of God for a test. Of, you know, I said test and try. See if, the, see if they'll come to church for a year before you go out with, before you marry them. See if they'll come to the house of God. Man, when guys used to knock at my do- door with my daughter, I'd take a good look at them and I could, I could spot a donkey. I said, donkey, <laughs> donkey. Listen, I never raised a thoroughbred to marry a donkey. So parents, you understand what I'm saying? You're not raising thoroughbreds to marry no donkey. Uh-uh. I was looking for a thoroughbred. Oh, Yeah. I need to tell you this for some reason or another, but some guys would come to the house and if, you know, if I thought they were the donkey, I, I'd give them the thumbs down to my wife. Ah. Well, I remember my son-in-law, when he, when he came over, I said, if he, we were coming from the store, and I said, if he helps me out with the groceries, I'm going to see that he's a servant. And, if he, and, I, and I said to my daughter, I said, whoever you marry is going to ask to borrow one of my books. I just know that he's going to be a man that wants to read and study the word. Well, as soon as we drove up, he came up and said, can I help you with the groceries? I'm thinking, mm-hmm servant spirit I like that then later on he's we're talking about a book he said can I borrow one of your books I'm like oh yeah yeah I like this guy <laughs> putting God first amen now first ministry above all else is really simple it's profoundly important he said this thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart not half-heartedly but all of your heart look at this with all of your soul with all of your strength with all of your mind and your neighbor as yourself loving God with everything my God, this is what he called us to do. This is our first love, putting him first. Now, I want to show you this because I'm almost done here. He said, remember then from the height you have fallen. Wait a minute, God. I'm in church. I'm not token, smoking, running around. And you said I've fallen? That's what, that's what he was saying to Ephesus. They were shocked. Wait a minute, I've fallen? Yeah, because Christ was not first in their life. He said, repent. Change your inner man to meet God's will. And do the works you did previously when you first knew the Lord. Now this not only works out in relationship with God, it also works out in your marital relationships. Go back and do the first things again. Bring flowers, send cards, tell each other you love each other. That kind of stuff. When I first knew the Lord, or else I will visit you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you change your mind and repent. So what are the first words? Spending time in His Word. Do, do you pray? You know, the, oh, the joy of sharing the Word of God with someone else. I'm going to tell you, I was so happy yesterday to win that captain to the Lord. That was the big fish of the day. All day long, I was fishing. And when nothing was biting, I kept thinking, i got to have an opportunity. The big fish is there. He's on the line. Don't want to lose him. want to bring him to Christ. That's what excited me. So remember how excited you were about telling other people about Jesus. That's the first works. Now, something he said in verse 6 he said, yet you have this in your favor, and to your credit, you hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which, uh, that what they are doing as corruptors of the people, which I myself also detest or hate. In other words, he's saying, I hate what these guys are doing, so I want to show you what their doctrine of Nicolaitans were. Now, the Nicolaitans taught a corrupt doctrine. Doctrine is very important. We must judge everything according to God's written word. We never cast aside our doctrine or theology. We test everything by the word of God. So, so important. Now, Doctrine determines your character, what we are, behavior, what we do, and destiny, where we go. And if it wasn't important, Jesus spoke about it, okay? I want to show you this, and I'm going to tell you what their doctrine was. Matthew 16, 11, he said this, How is it that you don't understand that I spake to you not concerning bread, that you should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees? They understood how then that he bade them to beware of the leaven, not the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and Sadducees. In other words, what they were teaching would corrupt them. So you have to beware of bad teaching because it can cause you to live a corrupt lifestyle. So important. Jesus mentioned this. The other thing is this about doctrine. Ephesians 4.14. He said that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine. Man, people are teaching a lot of things, but you've got to know the Word of God so you don't get moved this way and moved that way when someone says something that's outside of God's Word. He said, by the slight of men and the cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Being double-minded. 
with God. It'll cause you to be double-minded. This is how important doctrine is. Deuteronomy 32.2 says, My doctrine shall drop as the rain. My speech shall distill as the dew, as the small rain upon the tender herb. In other words, the anointing of the Holy Ghost, when you're walking in the pureness of His Word, will be upon your life. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this really quick, and I'm going to go, I'm almost finished, okay? Paul admonished Timothy about doctrine. Look what he said. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this, thou shalt save thyself and them that hear thee. In other words, you're going to be saved and the people you're preaching to will be saved. So, in other words, if you're, if you're listening to lies, it'll cause you to get away from the, the truth and get away from Christ. He said, but speak thou things which become sound doctrine. And again, he said, thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, and patience. This is what Paul said. So doctrine is so, so important. And I'm, I'm gonna, not going to read all of this. I'm just going to say this really quick. He said, good doctrine equals a holy life. Bad doctrine, immorality, and evil. When people are teaching wrong things, you'll find immorality and all kind of negative things. Actually, I do want to read one of these. Verse uh, 2 Timothy 4 and 3. Well, actually, let me read two. Preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with long suffering and doctrine. Look at this. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust or strong desires, they shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. In other words, people not preaching the truth. Mm. So what was the doctrine of Nicolaitans? This is what it was. Is that they were teaching that they were over the people. That you had to go through them to get to God. That's what they're saying. Hey, if you want to get to God, you've got to go through me. You've got to go through me if you want to get to God. That was the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. And that was not what God ever desired. Nico means conquer or rule over. And Latians is where we get the word laity, common man. Well, here's the truth. Is that you're called to the priesthood of the Most High God. You're called as a kingdom of priests. You don't have to go through anybody, confess your sins to anyone. You go directly to God. You and God. Amen. It's you and God. Straight up. And that's what the Nicolaitans were teaching. The other thing that they were teaching was this. Some of the early church fathers said that Nicholas was one of the first deacons in the church. And he taught sexual immorality, that you could, have, you could live in a, in a sexual immoral lifestyle and live in sin and gluttony and, and sex. That's what he taught, and Nicolaitans taught this. And Jesus said, I hate this thing. Now, if it sounds like it's far out, I want to show you this. Our day is not too far from that. As a picture of Church of the Savior, gay wedding this Sunday at church. Wow. Now, years ago, gay meant happy, but, you know, my goodness. And some Christians are saying they're, they're gay and a Christian. No, if you're happy, that's okay, but not living a homosexual lifestyle. No, that's sin. Rebellion against God. Rebellion against God, and it's rooted in pride. A lot of preachers won't say this anymore because they're worried about the numbers and the crowds, but I'm really, I'm really concerned about two things. What does God think, number one? That's what I'm concerned with. And number two, about men's souls. I don't want to preach a lie to anybody. I don't want somebody on that day when they stand before God Almighty and God says, why did you live in a rebellious lifestyle? Why did you live in fornication? Why did you live in a homosexual lifestyle? He said, because the preacher told me I could. You're not going to point a finger at me. I'm going to tell you the truth in love. To repent, turn to God, live for God, live a holy life. Because without holiness, no man will see the Lord. That's the truth. Love tells you the truth. Amen? I'm, I'm almost done here. Jude 1.4. For certain men have crept in stealthily, gaining entrance secretly by a side door. Their doom was predicted long ago. Ungodly, impious, profane persons who pervert the grace, the spiritual blessing and favor of our God into lawlessness and wantonness and immorality and disown and deny the sole Master and Lord, Jesus Christ the Messiah, the Anointed One. Now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip on to this right here. Revelations 2 and 7. Now, this is the promise. So he said, okay, this is what you got to correct. This is what you're doing. Here's the one thing. Here's the promise. If you do it, if you repent. He said, he who is able to hear, let him listen to and give heed to what the Spirit says to the assemblies, the churches. To him who overcomes. That's the word Nike. Where you get Nike shoes, that means get the victory. Uh, or you're victorious. I will grant to eat of the fruit of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of the midst of God. He said, you've got to overcome. So we've got the ability to overcome. If you feel like you're drifting from God, you've got the ability to come right back in Christ and stir up that first love again. Why don't you bow your heads with me right now? As I'm going to stop there. And I need to ask you two things. The first thing, if you've never come to Jesus Christ, I'm going fishing today. I want to bring you to Christ. I want, to meet, I want you to meet Jesus. Jesus is the most precious person. I want you to meet Jesus. If you've fallen away from God, if you've backslidden, if you went back into sin, I want you to give your heart to Jesus Christ today. Give Him your heart today. 
the Bible says, like this man asked me yesterday, how can I be saved? And I said, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. You believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. So pray this with me. If you don't know the Lord and you want to, say this with me. Jesus, save me. I confess you as the Lord of my life. I believe that you died for me. You were buried. And the third day you rose again. And I thank you, Father, according to your word, that I'm saved because I prayed this prayer. It's so simple to get your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Here's the next thing I want you want to pray with you about. If your heart's drifted from God, that He's not first in your life anymore, that you pushed Him aside, that other things have become first in your life, I want you to put your hands on your heart. And Father, I pray for every heart in this place. Father, that, Lord, their heart would be first place with you. That, Lord God, their hearts would burn bright for you, Lord God, that you would circumcise their heart and cause their first love to burn brightly in their heart again, Lord God, that they would love you with all the heart, all the soul, all the mind, Father, and all their strength. Father God, I ask this in Jesus' precious name. For your saints today, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I'm going to ask my prayer team to come up here if you could. Prayer team, come on up here. Come on up. I'm a, I want you all to stand because I want to bless you as I close out the service today. If you want prayer, if you need more of God, you need somebody to lay hands on you and pray with you, uh, if you need a healing, you're physically infirm, you need a healing, tell them, say, hey, look, I need a healing, and they're going to anoint you with oil and pray for you, for your miracle, amen? But I want to bless you right now, so just lift your hands up. Father, I break every negative word ever spoken over your people, and I decree the favor of God, the mercy of God, the blessing of the Lord upon them. I ask that you increase them, you strengthen them with might by your spirit in their inner man, Lord God. Let favor be upon them. Let grace and mercy be upon their house. Let all their children know the Lord, Father. Lord God, from the, to, to the oldest to the youngest, Lord God. Father, I pray in Jesus' name, let health, healing, and prosperity be in their house. But most of all, may they have a heart after you, Lord God. I ask this, Lord God. Father, in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen.